So in the lecture today, we're going to explore why the Haitian Revolution, which abolished slavery and established a written constitution in which color was no bar to holding political or administrative office, why this revolution is rarely understood as one of the key events of the making of the modern world. We have the revolutions in France, which happened in 1789, and in the US in 1776, which are more often regarded as the foundational events of world history that bring into being the modern world. Their world historical status is presented as a consequence of being democratic revolutions that were organized around new understandings of equality and the address of older forms of political and social hierarchy. This has been so despite the fact that the franchise, that is the right to vote, was restricted to white men who had property, and it also involved the dispossession of indigenous peoples and the enslavement both of them and transported Africans. Despite this, the French Revolution and the American Revolution are often regarded as the democratic revolutions that brought into being the modern world. In contrast in this lecture, what I want to suggest is that the Haitian Revolution doesn't simply deserve to sit alongside the French and US revolutions, but it actually far exceeds their scope and vision and really ought to be understood as one of the revolutions that brings into being the modern world. Briefly, why I suggest this is because Haiti was established on the basis of the freedom of all of its populations, and it was organized around the political commitment opposed to colonization and enslavement. The principles that were established in the French and American revolutions are often argued to motivate the overcoming of slavery and other exclusions. However, it could be argued that the Haitian Revolution actually did this at the time. And yet very few of the standard accounts of modernity even mention Haiti, let alone afford it any real significance. Eric Hobsbawm, for example, hardly mentions Haiti in his Age of Revolutions, and even avowedly global histories of the birth of the modern world, such as Jürgen Osterhammel's Transformation of the World or Christopher Bailey's uh, Birth of the Modern World. They both devote much more attention to France and the US than to Haiti. One notable exception is CLR James's The Black Jacobins. So to say a little bit about Haiti prior to the revolution. Before the revolution, Haiti was known as Saint-Domingue. It was a French colony in the western part of Hispaniola. Hispaniola was the name of the island in the Caribbean, which was also claimed by the Spanish. At the time of the French Revolution, the French colony of Saint-Domingue was the most profitable part of the French empire. Raw materials, namely sugar, coffee and cotton, were grown on plantations there and they were worked by enslaved Africans. The commodities were then shipped to towns in France to be turned into products which could be sold around the world. A third of these commodities were consumed within France and the rest were exported, including back to Saint-Domingue, which was the largest export market for metropolitan France. By the end of the 18th century, there were over half a million enslaved African people living in Saint-Domingue, together with a sizable population of free and freed cut peoples of color. Conditions in the island were harsh, and even before the revolution in the metropole, that is in Paris, there had been uprisings and unrest on the island. Within two years of the revolutionary events in Paris, unrest re-emerged in the colony and continued until the state of Haiti was eventually established 12 years later. Revolts by enslaved people in Saint-Domingue in the early 1790s forced the French to send two commissioners, Sontanax and Polverel, to the colony to quell the rebellions. Instead, upon surveying the situation on the ground, they decreed the abolition of slavery in 1793. This is an important point because often we think about abolition happening as a consequence of events in the metropole, that is in the center, so in places like Paris. However, what becomes clear when we look at the history of Haiti is that the abolition of slavery occurred as a consequence of events in the island and earlier than their formal abolition that occurred in, in Paris a year later.
So this decree to abolish slavery, which was first done in 1793, then comes to be ratified in Paris at the National Convention in 1794. And as a consequence, slavery is abolished in all of France's colonies. As CLR James sets out, in January 1794, three deputies, that is political representatives from Saint-Domingue, arrived in Paris to participate in the Constituent Assembly. They were Bellet, a formerly enslaved person who had bought his own liberty through labour in his own time, Mills and Dufay. Their entrance, according to James, aroused much excitement from the other assembled deputies, as it was indicative of the last gasp of the aristocracy of the skin and the move towards the consecration of full equality. They were welcomed as representing the free citizens of Saint-Domingue. Bellet addressed the assembly and he pledged support to the cause of the revolution, asking the convention to declare slavery abolished everywhere. The assembly rose in acclamation and as James states, a decree was drafted and dispatched immediately to all the French colonies, stating the National Convention declares slavery abolished in all the colonies. In consequence, it declares that all men without distinction of colour domiciled in the colonies are French citizens and enjoy all the rights assured under the constitution. This was quite a remarkable act because it suddenly made everybody within the French empire a French citizen. This is important to note here because only a few years later, when Napoleon wishes to restore slavery in the French colonies, what he's doing is seeking to enslave citizens. This led to understandable outrage in Saint-Domingue. CLR James reports to saint Louverture, who was one of the key figures of the revolution, stating, I took up arms for the freedom of my colour, which France alone proclaimed, but which she has no right to nullify. Our liberty is no longer in her hands. It is in our own. We will defend it or perish. And defend it they did as the war instigated by France led to her defeat. James credits Toussaint Louverture for this Herculean task of fashioning an army from untrained individuals who often didn't know how to use guns into a force capable of defeating European troops. Toussaint himself had no military background or training, but as James states, he incarnated the determination of his people never, never to be slaves again. And even after his arrest and deportation to France, he had done enough to lay the ground for the most extraordinary of political victories. The enslaved people who fought off French and British troops asserted their independence for France in 1804. So the island was now to be known as Haiti. Its first act was to precisely to do that, to rename Saint-Domingue Haiti. And one of the reasons why they did this was because Haiti was the name that had been given to the island by the Taino Arawak people who had lived on the island prior to French colonization and who had been effectively wiped out by those processes. So one of the first sacks of the people upon achieving their freedom was to honor the people who had preceded them on their land. This demonstrates that their understanding of colonization wasn't simply in terms of a repudiation of enslavement, but they also saw the preceding dispossession as central to their rejection of settler colonialism's inhuman moral economy. The next thing that they did was to establish a constitution. And the constitution was predicated on an understanding of citizenship that had much greater universal applicability than similar notions that had been developed in the French or US revolutions. Haiti was the first republic to be based on the freedom of all of its population and to be organized around an idea of blackness that represented the political commitment of a population opposed to colonization and enslavement. While in the US and France, there had continued to be a racialized understanding of the political sphere in which only propertied white men were allowed to vote, Haiti made color no bar to political participation. Everybody who is black is a citizen, the constitutional constitution declared. 
Blackness was not defined epidermally, that is in terms of skin color, but rather in terms of the political commitment of a population opposed to colonization. On Haiti, there were many workers who were indentured German and Polish workers who'd been brought to Haiti by the French. They were also now regarded as black, as were the children born to white women on the island. Alongside this, white men, specifically those wishing to claim the title of master or proprietor, were forbidden to own property on the island. As Anne Gulick argues, whiteness, a concept developed and deployed by the French, now denoted enemy status, the outcome of colonialism and slavery's mutual defeat. By making freedom from enslavement and freedom from racial discrimination the bedrocks of political understanding, and by delinking citizenship from race, the Haitian constitution radicalized and universalized the idea of equality. At the time that the revolutionary leaders were calling for the immediate and universal abolition of slavery and enacting that call through their revolution, there was no similar such call or act elsewhere across the Atlantic world. The American Revolution in the US, for example, maintained slavery as central to the constitution of its own society, and the French maintained forms of domination and exclusion within their colonies and over their colonized populations. So why don't we know about Haiti? Why is there such a silence about this revolution? Well, one of the things to note is that the silencing of this revolution happened almost immediately, with France establishing a total economic blockade of the island. The blockade was not only a punitive act by Napoleon to punish Haiti for emancipating itself, but it sought also to manage the contagion of revolution and self-emancipation from spreading to other enslaved societies across the Caribbean and the Americas. What the blockade did was bankrupt Haiti within 20 years, and this blockade was only lifted in 1825 with the agreement by Haiti to pay France compensation for its loss of property. So France claimed that in the revolution, French citizens had lost property. Now this property involved the buildings, the land, the plantations, but it also involved those human beings who had been enslaved and who had had the temerity to emancipate themselves. They were included in the valuation that France did in terms of calculating how much it wished to recover. Those who had been enslaved, however, were not to be compensated for their enslavement or their dispossession. In the period when these conversations were happening, part of Haiti, the north of Haiti, was ruled by Henry Christophe. He fiercely opposed any compensation to be paid to the French, and he argued, and I quote, what rights, what arguments can the ex-colonists then allege to justify their claim for an indemnity? Is it possible that they wish to be recompensed for the loss of our persons? It is inconceivable that Haitians who have escaped torture and massacre at the hands of these men, Haitians who have conquered their own country by the force of their arms and the cost of their blood, that these same free Haitians should now purchase their property and persons once again with money paid to their former oppressors. As such, it wasn't until after his death that any transaction was made possible between Haiti and France. France demanded compensation of 150 million francs. To put this into context, at around the same time, France had sold the entire territory of Louisiana, which at the time constituted over 800,000 square miles, to the fledgling United States, doubling its size for 80 million francs. Unable to pay the coerced indemnity, the Haitian government took loans from French banks and entered into a cycle of debt that, as Du Bois argues, would last into the 20th century. This coerced debt was not repaid till the middle of the 20th century, by which time it is estimated that in today's money, France had taken from Haiti the equivalent of 21 billion US dollars. It was an extraction that determined Haiti's future poverty, 
and was significant to the establishment of France's continuing prosperity. The silences of history are many, and the consequences of their perpetuation are stark. We can only work towards justice in the present by taking into account the historical processes responsible for the configuration of our shared worlds. Reparative histories are one aspect of the reparations more broadly needed. CLR James, almost a century ago, brought to international attention a revolution that was rarely acknowledged as central to the events that brought into being the modern world. Almost a century later, it seems that scholars continue to be unwilling to acknowledge its importance beyond its own terms. The revolutions that have been standardly presented as leading to the emergence of the modern world have been established on the basis of dispossession and enslavement as central to their constitution. The one revolution of that period that explicitly challenged both dispossession and enslavement is the very one that has been silenced in our histories and historiographies of the making of the modern world. In light of this, it is no wonder that Michel Rolf Truyot suggests that the Haitian Revolution was the most radical of its age, and perhaps that it is silenced precisely because of its radical nature. The question that I'd like to leave you with is what do we need to do today to reclaim the significance of the Haitian Revolution to the making of the modern world.